What is up, my friends and fellow busy bees? Today's episode is inspired by a question that I received from one of my custom clients when she brought her dining table to me after having said she had a solid wood dining table that she wanted painted, and we went over the design plan and she sent photos over. We got it all sorted and set up, and then she came and delivered the piece with her husband. And I took a look at it and said, it's not solid wood, but it's okay because we're going to be painting it anyways. And she said, how can you tell? Which is a question that I get semi-frequently when I'm either showing the process of me going and searching for pieces at the thrift store and seeing a piece and kind of getting a vision for it, but having to know what materials it's made of in order to know whether or not I could actually make that vision come to life. And also from people who offer me pieces and kind of inevitably just say it's solid wood, because I think most people think most things are solid wood, but don't actually know how to tell when they aren't, because most pieces aren't, especially newer pieces that have been bought in the last couple decades. Unless it's a really high-end item that you've invested a lot of money in, the chances are it's probably not completely solid wood. And in today's episode, I want to teach you not only how to figure out what types of materials they are, but give you a little bit of insight into each material and what it is, the pros and cons of each of them, and teach you how you can identify which is which. And hopefully by the end of it, you'll realize that regardless of what material you come across, it doesn't mean that one is better or worse than the other. It just may or may not be better suited for you and the project that you're looking to take on. I do think non-solid wood furniture gets a bad rap because people are just probably a little bit uninformed or naive as to what that does or doesn't mean. Of course, wood is solid, it's sturdy, we know that it lasts, and so maybe that's what is driving that mentality, but that's not to say that a piece of furniture that isn't solid wood or has solid wood components but also has components that are made up of other materials can't last for decades and even centuries, assuming that it has been refinished properly and is being taken care of well. So first things first, In order to tell what material the piece that you're looking at is made up of, you're going to want to get up close and personal with it because you might see a piece and it looks like it's wood and so you assume it's wood because the finish appears to be wood and you might want to deduce immediately that that's what it is. However, manufacturers are pretty sneaky these days. They're pretty good at making things look like real wood when they are not. So it's good to have an idea of what the different possibilities are that it could be and the different ways that you can go about figuring out which it is. And a lot of the times you're going to come across pieces that have a mixture of multiple components. So you could come across a piece that has a solid wood top, veneer on the sides, and then the drawers are laminate. So you have to be sure as well, once you figure out how to identify these materials, to look at all the different components of the piece that you are looking at. And this is going to be especially important if you are trying to find a piece for a specific vision that you have in mind. Maybe you're trying to recreate a design that you saw on Pinterest or on Instagram. Or if you're sourcing a piece for a client who has sent you an inspo photo and you're now trying to find something that's the right shape and the right size in order to replicate a design, you're going to have to be really mindful of the materials that the piece is made up of if the client isn't just wanting a fully painted piece. And even if they are wanting a fully painted piece, to be honest, it's still important to know what you're working with because that's going to determine what you need to do to the piece in order to make it properly refinished and ready to withstand whatever situation it's going to be put in, whether it's in a high traffic area, whether there are maybe kids or pets in the house, whether there might be a lot of moisture in that area. All of these things are going to affect what you need to do to that piece in order for it to be able to withstand those conditions and stay in in good shape for years and ideally decades to come. So first up we have solid wood furniture. Pretty straightforward, right? It's furniture that's made from completely natural wood, except if it has any areas on it like fabrics and upholstery, any sort of metal fixtures or additives or hardware on the piece. Other than that, the whole piece is made from wood. 
some positives of that are that it is a classic option that you can choose. It works well with lots of different types of decor styles, and it's just a very natural, organic look. It can add texture to a room depending on where it's going to really give it that warmth and that wood feel. So it fits in with a wide range of styles and rooms that it's going in. It's also very versatile because there are so many different wood types and different finish options that you can put on it that the possibilities are quite endless of the way that you can make that piece look and the different configurations that you can put together in your design plan. Jumping on that point, it's also very unique since every wood piece is going to look a little bit different from another because of the fact that there are no two grain patterns that are the same. So there's different swirls and circles and lines and spots that could be all over the piece in different shapes and different sizes. So you could choose two buffets that are made from the exact same species of wood and have the exact same design, but they're going to look a little bit different just based on the piece of wood that is used to make that. So it provides a really one-of-a-kind piece that you can have in your home and feel, you know, like that's my piece and nobody has this exact same thing. There's also ample restoration potential because you can really take that piece in any direction that you'd like, whether you want to restore the wood, paint it, have a combination of the two. You could just keep it bare wood and add a stencil. Essentially, the world is your oyster. If you have a solid wood piece of furniture, whatever it is that you want to accomplish on that piece, you can probably do because you're working with that raw material. Like I said, solid wood pieces usually have a higher price point as well, so there's an increased value if you are going to be refinishing this piece and selling it to somebody else. They often retain their value for years and decades. They're even actually more valuable if they are decades and centuries old. Antiques often go for a pretty penny and they are often solid wood pieces. So that means even if you have the piece for quite a long time and you maintain it well in your home, that can usually be resold for a premium price compared to like a piece of Ikea furniture that's been sitting around and not really maintained very well. That might not have the same resale value. I don't mean to shit on Ikea, by the way, if I ever mention it in the podcast, but I feel like it's just a good like frame of reference of a large manufacturer of furniture that a lot of us would know just for the record. In case Ikea is listening and they want to sponsor me, I still like your stuff, okay? Solid wood furniture also is super durable. Like I said, it can last for centuries as long as it's maintained and kept in good care. And another positive of solid wood furniture is just the character that it has and that it can acquire over time. The material is obviously quite durable, especially in comparison to some of these other manufactured or less durable options that we're going to talk about in this episode, but it also has a lot of character, like softer woods, including cedar and pine, are often chosen because they are softer woods and they can really develop that character over time. You get distressing, you get a patina on it, and other signs of aging, like wear and tear, you'll often see fake distressed wood furniture pieces where people like beat the shit out of the wood so that it looks like it's been around for a hundred years, you have the option of being able to add that character in or just to have it naturally acquire it over time when you're working with a solid wood piece. And it's also a really easy material to work with in terms of having to do repairs because typically, unless it's something substantial that's been done to it, you can usually just sand and refinish that piece and get rid of any sort of dings or gouges in the wood. And even when you get things like cracking and separation, gluing them together usually is all that's needed. Now, some of the negatives that may be associated with having solid wood furniture is, like I mentioned, there is those soft wood species like pine. And because they're softer, although they can develop a lot of beautiful character to them, they also have the potential of getting damaged a lot more easily over time, especially on the spots that get a lot of wear and tear, like the edges and the corners that can be worn down from repeatedly brushing up against it or... I don't know, maybe you have a little furry friend that likes to nibble on the corners. But if you have something that's a harder wood, it doesn't necessarily scratch or dent as easily, so you might not have these issues to worry about. 
Another thing worth noting is that with solid wood furniture, the temperature and the atmospheric conditions can really make an impact on that piece. The atmospheric pressure can cause the wood, which is a natural element, to expand or contract depending on the heat and the moisture, and that can lead to cracking, splitting, and warping. So while people who are making these furniture pieces should ideally know how to design the furniture to prevent that from happening, it's still a risk and the movement always needs to be considered. Just be aware that this can be an option that happens to you and your pieces. And ways that you can prevent that are by keeping it away from places that moisture will be able to get into that piece where there's large temperature changes and when it's getting direct heat and other kind of wear like that, it'll help to keep your pieces in good shape. And then the last kind of negative or thing to be wary of when considering whether or not to get solid wood furniture or to be aware of if you're going to be reselling this furniture is that the cost is much more than something like a laminate or veneer. Like I said, solid wood furniture goes for a pretty penny typically, so if you're purchasing a piece for yourself, just think of it as an investment into a quality piece that you'll be able to have for the long term. And you know, a lot of people have pieces that are solid that they pass down through generations in their family, so if you're investing in a piece that maybe feels like it's a lot of money, just consider the fact that your kin and your grandchildren can inherit those pieces and enjoy them for years to come. And maybe it doesn't always look the way that it looks right now, but maybe they get it refinished and they are able to live a whole new life with that piece. So then next up we have wood veneer. And a veneer is just a thin piece, a thin slice of natural wood that's attached either by gluing or pressing it onto an inner panel or panels of fiberboard, which is MDF or HDF, we'll talk about those later, or particle board or ply core slash ply wood. So some common types of veneer that you may come across are walnut veneer, ash veneer, red oak veneer, white oak veneer, birch veneer, acacia veneer, and beech veneer. And we'll discuss the different materials that the veneer may be attached to later on in the episode. Some of the positives that are associated with a piece that has veneer on it is that typically it's a more moderate price point. It costs more than something like laminate furniture, but definitely less than solid wood furniture since the veneer is using a minimal amount of those natural woods, especially when you're talking about higher quality or woods with more of a high price point. It makes them much more affordable because it's much less of that wood that you are using. It's just enough to show the top and the finish. It's not necessarily all the way through the piece, so it makes it a much more reasonable price point. And for how much or how little of that premium wood is being used, it really does give it an authentic look. Even though it's a very thin layer of wood, it really gives the furniture piece a high quality look, and that's, you know, all we're really looking for at the end of the day, is probably the aesthetics and the function of the piece. And now there are a good amount of refinishing options with veneer. However, I will say that if you are just working on your first piece of furniture, I would probably caution you to avoid veneer if possible, if you intend on staining the piece. Just because it's so easy to blow through if you don't know what you're doing, you haven't used an electric sander before, for example. It's something that I still do every now and then when I'm not paying attention. So not to say that you can't, just it might be a little bit disheartening if you come across an issue like that the first time that you're doing a furniture makeover, and I don't want you to be scared away from doing more in the future. So I would probably recommend steering clear of a veneer if you intend on sanding it down and staining it, especially if it's a bit of a thick layer that you're going to have to sand away first, but that's just my opinion. But it does offer more refinishing options than some of the quote-unquote fake wood materials that we'll talk about later. So when you have a veneer, you can sand it down, scrape it down, whatever your method may be, and then stain it. You can also paint it, obviously, or do a combination of the two, but it does give you multiple options when it comes to the design of the piece. And compared to solid wood pieces, wood veneers are much less prone to that movement that I was talking about with the atmospheric pressure and the temperature and humidity. So you're much less likely to get any splitting, warping, or problems with the pieces fitting together when you're working with a piece that has a veneer versus an all wood furniture piece. 
And you also get the option of having more exotic or premium wood for a much cheaper price. So if you have your sights on a certain piece that has maybe some of that acacia wood that can be a little bit more expensive, but you don't want the price point associated with it, using a wood veneer, whether you're putting it on yourself or you're finding a piece that has it, is going to be much cheaper than finding a solid wood piece that is similar to that. So keep that in mind. It's a way to save your money. Some of the negatives associated with veneers, though, are that it can scratch easily, even though overall it is pretty durable. You do have to be careful with the furniture compared to something like laminate or even solid wood, especially hardwoods. So high traffic areas like tabletops or even potentially the tops of nightstands, depending on how much you're using them and what the finish is over it, could be a little bit dicey, so just keep that in mind especially if these veneers aren't coated with a good surface finish. It can also be really easy for liquids to get absorbed through the wood, and that can then cause warping and other issues underneath the veneer, as well as things like water damage on it. So make sure that you're ensuring that you have a really good protective finish on top of it. And there is some difficulty associated with repairing veneer. Now, if you intend on, say you've come across a piece and it's beautiful, you recognize that it has a veneer on it, but there is some chipping or some pieces that are broken on it or even missing. If you intend on painting that piece, not a big deal. Your average furniture flipper or DIYer would be able to just fill that in with something like a wood filler or Bondo, sand it smooth, prime it, and then paint it, and it's good to go. However, if you intend on keeping it kind of raw wood or staining it a certain color and you want to fix that veneer first, it requires a little bit more depending on the damage, a little bit more time, effort, and experience. Sometimes if it's just lifting up, it's as easy as getting some glue up under there, clamping it down, letting it dry thoroughly, and it's good as new. You can kind of disguise it a bit, but when you're having to purchase a new piece of veneer to put it on and delicately fill it in, or you're trying to disguise it with things like furniture crayons and stuff like that, it can it can get a little bit more convoluted. So just keep in mind that if you intend on restoring the piece and keeping it with that wood finish, that there's going to be some added time, effort, or costs associated with it. Now the real question, how do I tell if the piece that I'm looking at is a veneer or if it's solid wood? I want you to remember TWED. T-W-E-D. T, we want to feel it for texture. On a solid wood piece, especially with certain wood species like ash, oak, and walnut, those have open grain wood. So you're going to feel the ridges and the rise of that natural grain if you rub your hand on it. You'll feel that texture. And basically, if you're looking at the piece or you're closing your eyes and rubbing your fingers over it, you'll be able to essentially feel the pattern that you're seeing. You know what I mean? However, if the surface is completely smooth to the touch and it says that it's one of those wood species, it's probably a veneer. The W in TWED is to weigh it, or you can just lift it up yourself. Because if it is a solid wood piece of furniture, it's going to be much, much heavier than a piece that is a veneer or a combination of the two. The E in TWED look for end grain. If the furniture has an edge grain on all sides of it, when you look at the different edges of it, then it's a veneer that has edge banding around it, versus if it was a solid piece of wood, it would not have that. And the D in TWED is to look for discrepancies in the grain. Like I mentioned, real wood is not standardized. It is not perfect and flawless in terms of its grain pattern. There are discrepancies and just different characteristics that make each piece of wood unique. If you see variety in it when you look at that piece, it's likely real solid wood. But if you feel and you can see a repeated grain pattern, then you're probably working with a veneer or it could even be a laminate or something like that. If there's no grain whatsoever on the piece, probably a veneer. Another material you might come across is particle board, which is made by mixing lots of bits of wood, sawdust, and adhesive like resin together, and then heat pressing it under extreme pressure into a flat panel or plank. The surface of the particle board is much more dense and compact than the middle because on that surface layer, the wood chips are thinner than those that are in the middle layer. Just a little fun fact. 
So the good thing about particle board, it's almost entirely manufactured from recycled timber wood, so it makes it really sustainable and eco-friendly. And it's also much more cost-effective compared to something like plywood to use. However, it is quite soft and brittle, so that can be really difficult to use if you plan on making changes to the piece and you want to be adding in nails or screws. It's really soft and brittle, so it can't necessarily hang on to those in a really sustainable way compared to something that's a little bit more durable and strong like plywood. So it's not great for anything that's going to have any heavy duty use. And particle board also absorbs a lot of paint or whatever you're adding onto it. So if you're going to be adding paint or some sort of finish like that, make sure that you first seal or prime that piece so that the particle board doesn't just drink that all up because you'll end up going through a lot more product in the long run because it's just going to try and gobble that all up. And honestly, particle board's kind of ugly. On its own, it is not a very desirable finish for furniture, but like I mentioned, to be used as a base for a veneer or used in conjunction with solid wood, it will give it a much better appearance. And the way that you can tell if you are working with particle board is that basically you're not going to see any wood grain when you look at that piece on the side. It's just going to look like small bits of wood that have been glued together and pressed really tightly. Another material you might come across is a fiber board or MDF, which is medium density fiber board. And that's made in a similar fashion by pressing glued wood fibers together into flat panels. The difference being that MDF has a much smoother surface than particle board because it's made with smaller fibers. Because of that, it is much better for painting because it has a much smoother surface. So that's worth noting if you have the option of you're doing a build and you're trying to decide between the two or you're just trying to figure out how to prep that surface. Keep in mind that that's going to absorb much less of your product. And again, the way that you would tell if you're working with a fiber board or MDF is that it has those small bits of wood that look glued together and there will be no wood grain present or apparent. The next material you might come across is ply core or ply wood, which is made out of many thin wood layers, which are glued together in an alternating grain pattern. And basically, the more layers there are, the thicker the plywood sheet will be great thing about this is it's super solid and stable. The panel is still all wood, but by alternating the grain direction on each layer, the panel is just much more stable dimensionally than solid wood, ironically, because it isn't susceptible to expansion and contraction, which is caused by those temperature changes and the atmospheric pressure that I mentioned. Because it's much more stable and solid, it is good at holding in nails and screws, so if you intend on making changes to the piece, it'll be much more likely to stay solid in a plywood versus in a particle board or MDF. When it comes to cost, using plywood is more affordable than solid wood because the wood that it's using in the center is just not quite as desirable compared to the solid wood pieces. However, it is still more costly than other wood-based sheet options like MDF or fiberboard, so it falls somewhere in the middle. A positive, though, is that it is super versatile because there are different densities and thicknesses of plywood that you can choose from. So you have different options depending on the purpose that you need it for. If you're going to be, for example, creating doors to be added to a cabinet or something like that, there's a lot more options in terms of thickness to match the piece. Or if you need to be adding a top onto a dresser, for example. And the way that you'll be able to tell if you have come across a piece with ply core or plywood in it or on it is that you're going to see several layers of wood glued together. So you'll see those layers basically when you look at the side of it. And the last material that you may come across on or in your furniture piece is laminate. And laminate is a material other than wood. It's usually plastic with a coating that sometimes makes it look like it's wood. So it's, it's a little bit sneaky. A lot of people think that they have solid wood pieces when they in fact have a laminate piece. I see this on Marketplace all the time. And it usually has a solid wood price on it, which is hilarious. So a common laminate surface is white melamine. However, laminates can often be made to look like different wood species because it uses a printed process and prints a photo, essentially, of the wood texture onto the plastic surface. And then they attach those wood-looking sheets to the top of MDF. 
And there's two different types of laminate. So there's thermofused laminate, which is the paper with a wood design applied to particle board, or high pressure laminate, which is HPL, you may have heard it referred to as. And that's a paper design pattern bonded with sheets of craft paper before it's bonded to a particle board. And so that's much more durable and flexible than thermofused laminate, but it is much more expensive. So keep that in mind. And how to tell if you come across a piece that is laminate. If you just feel the surface, you'll be able to tell that it isn't wood. It'll just feel smooth and it's kind of has a plasticky feel to it rather than kind of the warmth and the texture that you would feel with real wood. And it also, if you look at it on an angle, it'll look a little bit shiny and have more of a sheen to it than a piece of wood with a top coat would. The great thing with laminate is that it can come in so many different finishes and appearances, so it's super versatile. Like I said, you can essentially print whatever type of wood grain pattern onto laminate that you want, so your options are kind of endless. And it actually is quite durable because it's that plasticky feel. It's protected against chipping and scratches a lot more than something like a wood or a veneer would be. So if you have sharp tools and other things like that around, a surface that's laminate might actually be a great option for you because you're not going to get those dents and that character that we talked about earlier. And something that you may not know about me, I love little motivational messages. They get me fired up and I keep a list of them in my notes app on my phone that have been especially catchy or have spoken to me over the years. And I end every podcast episode with one in hopes that you leave our time here each week feeling inspired, motivated, and ready to take on whatever comes your way this week. So this week's Mel's motivational message is from Gandhi, and it is to live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as if you were to live forever. Listen, you guys know that I am a lifelong learner, and I highly recommend it to anyone and everyone. I think that once we are done with schooling, at whatever point we decide to be done with schooling, that's often when we stop intentionally learning, and we can kind of remain stagnant if we let ourselves. If you don't have ways in your day-to-day that you are seeking out new information and new perspectives and learning about new things, and I should say factual things, um, data-driven things, scientifically proven things, you know, and not just seeing the title of an article as you're scrolling through social media or hearing somebody say something but not looking into whether or not it is accurate because there is a lot of disinformation out there in all subjects on the internet. But if you are just kind of stagnant and hope that the learning comes to you, it honestly probably won't because between you listening to a playlist on the way to work and then maybe reading the headlines in the newspaper and then coming home and watching reality TV until you go to bed at night, there's not a lot of opportunities for new information and new skills to be acquired in your life. So I'm a big proponent of booking this into your day, working it into your day, however feels right for you. I work in the garage all day and so I always am listening to podcasts and audiobooks in order to expand my mind, my understanding of things, to learn more about the skills that I have, to acquire new skills, to hear about differing opinions than my own. And I think that's all super important to just be a well-rounded person. I've talk about it often, but I am an only child who grew up in the bush, and I am very aware of the fact that I am probably limited in my perspective based on what I've experienced and the people that I grew up with experienced, and I make it a pretty big priority in my life to integrate learning in so that I am, you know, as good of a human as I can be and as well-rounded as I can be, because if you're not intentional about it, you're just going to be who you are, and that might be great for you, but I kind of always think that I can be better and more evolved version of myself the older that I get. So I try to learn as if I'm going to live forever and I'm going to want to have as much knowledge as possible. This is why I also love trivia because you just learn so many random factoids. And when I learn random factoids, I always try and keep those in my brain for when they may one day come up in a trivia situation. 
So if you haven't been integrating learning into your life quite as often recently, busy bees, number one, you already took the first right step by listening to today's episode. I hope it taught you a thing or two that you may not know about some materials that you're working with in your furniture pieces or how to identify them. And now, since, I mean, you already took the first step, why not take another step? Seek something else out today. Go add some new podcasts to your queue. Start a book that you've been putting off about a subject that you don't know all that much about, but you're interested in. Seek out a documentary while you're scrolling on Netflix instead of hopping into mindless reality TV. Something that I've never gotten into and I don't really understand wanting to numb your mind in that way. But then again, I spend hours on TikTok, so who am I to talk? I hope you take that learning into your day and into your week and beyond. All right, that is it for now. I so appreciate your time and I will catch you guys next week.